we are as a people, inherently and historically, opposed to secret society, opposed to secret oaths, opposed to secret proceedings, secret for secret proceedings. No official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to, to, deserve to know. To know. And deserve to know. Welcome to Conspiracy Corner Podcast, everyone. This is Abe, your host. Time is now 5.44 a.m. It is March 25th, Friday, 2022. Um, just got off work. It was a pretty chill night. Actually, for a double truck night, I actually got everything done on time. We even had an hour or two uh, condition. So... That's pretty much when you pull the items on the shelves to the front, so that way it makes it look nicer. But, um, yeah, so no complaints there. Um, was off yesterday, had a pretty chill day. We didn't go out and do anything. We hiked everything that we were going to hike of uh, Shaker Town, so we're caught up on hiking unless we find someplace new. But, um, yeah, we got some sad news today. Jordan Maxwell died. Um, he was one of my heroes. Uh, definitely woke me up. Um, I'd say probably the biggest content creators that woke me up within this uh, basically being a conspiracy theorist was uh, William Cooper, Jordan Maxwell. Um, probably those two the most. So it was kind of a bummer. To find that out, um, I definitely I liked Jordan. He spent his whole life dedicated to spreading the truth. Didn't really profit off of it. Um, he took donations. Uh, I know at a lot of points in his life he did a lot of couch surfing. Just dedicated his entire life just to spreading the truth. He didn't even have like a job or anything. That was his job. So. Um, but yeah, and, uh, one thing I always liked about him is he always would go on, like, smaller podcasts and smaller radio shows and stuff, so to me, I always thought that was cool, because it's like, I, I wish I had the chance to interview him, and, like, I felt like if I had the equipment and all that, that I could have, and that it just... I think he would have said yes, you know, because I've seen him on so many other small channels. Um, he's very humble when it came to that. Um, but yeah, uh, I found this article that Jordan Maxwell, R.I.P. and obituary. How did occult book author Jordan Maxwell die? Um, Jordan Maxwell, an esoteric researcher and author, passed away lately after brief after a brief illness. His death came as a shock to his fans and his followers, who had taken over the internet to express their grievances and condolences to the deceased soul and family. They are also thanking him for sharing his knowledge with the rest of the world. The number of people who believe in the occult is rapidly increasing as the internet becomes more accessible. People like Jordan have sprung up as a result of this idea, claiming to have observed such events and sometimes providing evidence to back up their claims. Because people frequently claim that this knowledge is esoteric, there is no sure way to check these views. Jordan is a the researcher and author of books of the books that focus on the occult. There are many claims that he made that are questionable, 
but some of them make sense in the current scenario, according to some people. He has made claims like humans are mutating in a certain scientific matter. He has also given talks about the existence of secret societies like the Illuminati. And that's about it. So it sounded like he just had some illnesses that was going on. I know he was getting up there in age. And um, I honestly, uh, every time I'd see him on an interview, I'm like, holy shit, there's, there's Jordan again. Like, but thinking in the back of my head, man, he is getting old. Like, he's got to be on like one foot out the door. So I, it wasn't a surprise to me. I knew it was coming. Um, but today, uh, I got some Jordan Maxwell audio. I'm going to take the back burner, burner and just go ahead and in honor of Jordan Maxwell, play that. Um, and that'll pretty much be the episode today. So if you've never heard Jordan Maxwell speak or anything like that, then stay tuned and turn it up, sit back and relax and enjoy. On this episode, I'd like to talk a little bit about the sun and its symbolic importance in the whole story of the Zodiac. Now, as we begin the story of the sun and the ancient religions of the world and how much the sun has dominated civilization for as long as we have records, we need to go back to the very beginning. And that's a long time ago. Let's go back to Egypt. We'll start in Egypt because that's one of the oldest civilizations on the earth. And we will see how Egypt developed the concept of the importance of the sun in relation to theology and spirituality and religion. Now this is an ancient symbol for the sun, prehistoric, that the ancient peoples drew to represent the sun as an equal arm cross within the circle. Here is a artifact that was found in England. It's on hinge. It's on a golden circle, which represents the sun. And then you'll see the cross in between. And this is about 4,500 years old. Almost 5,000 years ago, ancient mankind drew pictures of what they perceived the sun to be as an equal arm cross. And you will see it also in the ancient religions of the near Middle East, the different ancient gods in the Phoenician, Canaanite, Sumerian systems. They all had the equal arm cross. But it's important to remember that the sun was never perceived as a god. It was perceived to represent the spiritual qualities of God and that it brought life to the earth, it brought warmth to the earth, it brought energy for us to live. So all of the good things about God and his creation was best represented by the symbol of the sun. Sometimes the sun actually even looks like it has an equal arm cross in the heavens. The reason why it's four equal arms on the cross is because there are four equal seasons of the year. We have north, east, west, and south, the four corners. Then each one of those four corners represents a season of the year, spring, summer, autumn, winter. This is why you have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because they're talking about the life of the sun. The ancient peoples, like us today, we draw a circle, a round circle, and we divide it into four equal parts. And so now you have an equal arm cross inside of a circle. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, spring, summer, autumn, winter. There are a lot of symbolism in the Bible that we have misunderstood and mistaken. The whole idea is the four lodging places of the sun gives us our four seasons of the year. You will find the equal arm cross all over the world. 
every race and creed and color has the same symbol for the ancient sun. The Nordics had the symbol, the Vikings kept the symbol, ancient France used the symbol. The symbol was on rocks and carvings and paintings. Even in India, you have the equal arm cross, the Celtic and the Celtic Druids in Europe and England and Ireland had an equal arm cross. Native Americans used it, Central America, and especially in Mayan, in Inca, and some of the ancient uh, religions in South America have used the equal arm cross. So it became known all around the world that the equal arm cross within a circle represented the old 5,000 year old petroglyph concept of the sun. Today people see it everywhere and so it has become not really important because it's just a general symbol that people realize is a cross. Here is a picture of the ancient Nordic peoples that were preparing for what we would call today the Easter sunrise service. Here the ancient peoples in Europe realized that the sun was coming back to the northern hemisphere and it would bring with it the warmth, the food, and life. And so they all gathered with their sun symbol to welcome back the sun that had died in winter and was coming back to the northern hemisphere. It became known as what we call today Easter. The circle on the cross is not a man dying on a cross. It's the sun on the north, east, west, and southern parts of the earth. The idea being, of course, is that when the sun dies in winter, and then when it is reborn on December 25th, the sun actually begins to move northward. And when it does, that tells the world that the sun is now coming back to the northern hemisphere, bringing back the sun to us in the northern hemisphere. Because for us in the northern hemisphere, the sun was dead to us because it was in the southern hemisphere. But now it's being born again and coming back to the northern hemisphere. That's the whole story in itself, is the vision of the sun going southward, dying on the cross, and then being reborn on December 25th when it moves one degree northward and now is coming back and sort of springing back to life. And so on the, in the spring, we call it springing back to life. Well, you will have the symbol everywhere and even the European agency for the Euro uses the same equal arm cross to represent the new Euro establishment you will always find in royalty throughout the world, royalty and governments always use the equal arm cross. The Nazis used it. Even in the parade of the Nazis used the swastika, which is a symbol of the sun also. But you will see also that they are using the equal arm cross. Coptic Christians, even the kings and rulers like the uh, emperors of Europe, always had the equal arm cross on their staff, equal arm cross with the sun god and churches. In September, mid-September, around the world, Christians will gather in schools and universities to worship their, their god Jesus, who died on a cross, and what they call this ritual, uh, see you at the pole. See you at the pole means that Christians will gather around the flagpole at their colleges and schools to uh, venerate and to worship Jesus, God's Son, the light of the world. Well, of course, the Son is the light of the world. But here are Christians gathering to worship Jesus, never realizing that they are actually meeting around a very ancient symbol of the old petroglyph cross. But this symbol of an equal arm cross within the circle represents an old ancient idea of how to picture the sun. And it's really extraordinary to, to notice that all churches use that same symbol. 
and all over the world, people do not realize that this cross that they think represents Christianity is actually for over 5,000 years old. It's an ancient, prehistoric symbol of the sun. Jesus has always represented the sun, the S-U-N, not S-O-N. The etymology of the word for the sun. You see that sun can be S-U-N or S-O-N, and depending on how it's used. S-O-N and S-U-N are used interchangeably in Christianity. And illustrations. In the Christian church, you will see they're all actually a round, glowing sun. Not a young child or a baby or a man, but the S-U-N. There's two words, S-U-N and S-O-N. But the Christianity and Judaism are based on the worship of the S-U-N, not S-O-N. That's a misunderstanding. That misunderstanding is part of the history of the English language. Because if you go back into the King's Old English, you go back into the history of the English language, there is a phenomenon which in English class you will learn is called the lazy O. The lazy O is a phenomenon in English which means that translators always translated son, S-O-N and S-U-N, all in the same sentence. And so it became known as the lazy O. They were talking about the S-U-M, but they used S-O-M because they were lazy. They just used either one. The mother of Jesus is Mary, which is actually Mari, M-A-R-I, not M-A-R-Y. Mari means pure. And therefore, the mother of Jesus is a virgin or Virgo, one of the 12 signs of the zodiac is a Virgo, the Virgin. So here is Mari, or Mary, the Virgin, Virgo, holding the baby Jesus, or God's Son, the light of the world. Today we still have Jesus as God's Son in the heavens, and he became now a great sun god. But the question you need to ask yourself is, who owns the sun? You will assume that the sun must be owned by someone. Well, mankind doesn't own the sun. If anything, you would say maybe God owns the sun. So if it's God owns the sun, then it's God's sun, and he's the light of the world. Of course the sun is the light of the world. Looking at the communion host, the Catholic communion host, you will see it always looks like the old ancient petroglyph sun. You see that the sun and Jesus' hand represents the S-U-N. The Holy Eucharist represents the sun. This is why the priest in the church on Sundays will raise the, the, the sun. They will raise it. And why? Because that's what the sun does. It rises. So the sun rises. This is why we have the symbols on the host in the Catholic Church. It is always the old petroglyph sun. Jesus means God is with us. And you will see the priest is representing Jesus, how? As a son. All of this goes back many, many thousands and thousands of years before Christianity ever existed. It has nothing to do with Christianity at all. It has to do with exactly what it's showing, sun worship. And today we're still doing the same thing. We're worshiping the sun. And you will see the sun is prominent in all of Catholicism. Everywhere you look at Catholicism are uh, worshipers of the sun. Now here we have a picture of Jesus giving to the children a part of his body. And what is he giving them? A little round sun disc. We're told that we should all take part of his body at the first communion, in that communion in the Catholic Church, you're taking part of God's son's body. 
The whole idea is very obvious what's being talked about here. We're just talking about sun worship. The idea that the sun dies on the cross goes back to the old petroglyph cross. And so that's where we see it now all over the world, all Christianity. You'll see the sun is always dying on the cross because in the southern constellations, when you go down south, when the sun reaches the lowest part in the sky in southern hemisphere, there is a constellation of stars that look just exactly like a uh, cross. And so we say the sun, when it dies in December, it goes down and dies on the cross. The cross is called the Southern Cross. When he was dead, but now he's coming back to the Northern Hemisphere because he promised he would return. And he is returning again in the spring. Solar symbolism of the sun going southward each, uh, each day until it finally reaches uh, December 22nd. When it's, it's its lowest point in the southern sky, it's down south now. It's gone south. But on December 22nd, the sun goes as far in the south as it's going to go. And it stops going southward on December 22nd. It doesn't go any further southward. Then on the 23rd and 24th, it rises on the same degree. And therefore, for three days, it doesn't move at all. It stays at that same degree. So we say, and the ancient people said, that Jesus, or God's Son, died for three days. Why? Because it was moving every day, and now it's not moving for three days. So for three days, the sun was dead. And on December 25th, the sun moves one degree northward, which indicates, our, our, and even the United States Navy will show you on their instruments that it indicates the sun is now alive again he's born again now he's going to work his way back to the northern hemisphere because he said god's son said i will i will return well he does he returns every year so what do you see do you see a man on this cross do you see a man dying on the cross no this is what is actually meant by dying on the cross. It's the sun. During the summer, when the sun is in the northern hemisphere, it is in the constellation of Leo, so he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then when he dies, he dies in Capricorn down south when he goes south. And so now he dies in the winter. And then he comes back and springs back to life and when he comes back to the northern hemisphere, we call it spring. But when it crosses the equator, the sun will have to cross the equator coming back to us in the north. When it crosses the equator, it is said to have passed over the equator. So in the Hebrew religion, when the sun passes over the, the, the coming back to the northern hemisphere, they call that celebration the Passover. But for Christians, they're worshiping the sun also as it passes over, but they refer to it as the resurrection. The God's son has been resurrected. He's come back. It doesn't matter how you say it, a resurrection or a Passover. It just means the sun is coming back to us in the northern hemisphere. Sun worship is a very old religion dating back thousands of years before the Roman Empire. But in Rome, the sun god was called Mithra. Mithraism was the main religion in the Roman Empire at the time that Christianity was coming into, uh, coming into play in the Roman Empire. Emperor Constantine was a follower of Mithra. And Mithra uh, was God's son who died on a cross. He was dead for three days and rose again. The Emperor Constantine was famous for starting the, the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church was not started by Jesus. It was started by a Roman emperor. And it was, and it was headquarters in Rome, not the heaven. <laughs> it was mixing Judaism and Mithraism 
and some of the other religions of the of the uh, Arabic world that also worship the sun, and brought all of these different religions together in order to confirm the power of Caesar in Rome under one religion and one government. To it was a, actually a world government supposedly at the time. Catholic means universal meaning whatever air is Catholic because air is all over the world water is Catholic anything which is all over the world is Catholic because it's a Latin word that means universal Constantine was trying to unite all the religions of the Roman Empire into one religious divisions are very dangerous and they, are, and they can also harbor treason and, and anti-government and so Caesar realized if he could bring all the religions into one religion and call it Christianity, and yet it would have all the parts of everybody else's religion. It would have Judaism, uh, worship of, of the sun. It would have Yahweh as a part of it. It would have Mithraism as a part of it. So that everyone could agree to follow one religion which Caesar would rule from. He would rule from. And so it was a political move, that's all. But the point is that Constantine, the Roman emperor, founded the Roman Catholic Church. This is a Sumerian picturing uh, the sun on the altar. In the ancient world, uh, the Phoenician, Canaanites, Sumerians, uh, the Hittites, all of these ancient cultures always uh, had helmets, their military wore helmets with the rising sun symbol. The rising sun symbol is still used even today around the world on helmets and military. Here in Rome, you'll see the Romans wearing the rising sun. Again, you will see it here where the Romans, they were brutal rulers of the people, but their symbol was the rising sun. And so now let's look at the sun worship today and its ancient foundation, which was a cult of Solus Invictus. Solus Invictus is Sol, which is the sun, and invincible. The sun was said by the Romans, it was invincible. Why was the sun invincible? Because every year it came into its power in, in the summer, and then it would die in the winter to the, to the northern uh, hemisphere. But it would come back every year. It would come back to the northern hemisphere. So it may die in the winter, but it's coming back. It's invincible. You can't keep it down. And so we see today the, the pictures of Saul, and he's the sun riding across the sky. The sun was pictured in Rome as uh, riding on a chariot across heaven. And so the sun was that lucky old sun riding around heaven all day, roaming around heaven all day, on, a, on obviously on a chariot. And here is Solus Invicti, or uh, this is a picture of Mithra, and it shows the, the sun spokes, the sun rays around his head, the sun god of Rome. Now, in the doctoral theses, there's a very important book called The Cult of Solus Invictus. And in it, it, it shows you all of the connections with the Roman government, the Roman religion, the Roman commerce, the entire state of Rome and the ancient Roman Empire was all based on the sun. And you'll see like the sun cult uh, up to the first century of the empire, the political background of it, the establishment of the cult of Solus Invicti, the dogma, the teachings of the ancient the religion, Dysolus Invictus is the true Roman sun god. Of course, the Roman sun worship can be traced back to the ancient Egyptian sun, sun god, Amun Ra. So Amun Ra was, we, say, we use the word today, R-A-Y, Ra, sun Ra. But the ancient Egyptians called their god Ra. Which, that's where Ra comes from. So it was called the cult of Ra, or the cult of the sun Ra. And so here is Amun Ra, the official name of the sun god in Egypt. Amun Ra, A-M-E-N hyphen R-A. 
is Amun Re again. Now, when you see Amun Re, the Egyptian sun god was the supreme god of the universe, as, car, as, as, a, as said by the Egyptians. But what is important to remember is that Amun Re, uh, today, in our supposed modern day world, in our Christian church, both Catholic and Protestant, they refuse to give up the old pagan sun cult of Amun Re. And so today, this is why when you pray to God, you end up by saying Amen, because you're sending your prayer through God's Son, Amun Re. The Catholic Church is replete with all kinds of sun symbols. You'll always see the Pope wearing large sun symbols. It's on his hand, it's on his uh, gloves, it's on the outside of churches, it's at the top of churches also, implying the sun is risen. And uh, the sun rays are dominating the, uh, the Catholic Church all over the world. So here is uh, paintings on the, on the wall of the Vatican showing the angels, uh, showing the, the worker, the common man, the worker, to look to the sun for his food and for his life and for everything. Uh, God's sun is the light of the world. And so Catholic Church or the Vatican is promoting sun worship. Everywhere the Catholic Church and Christians meet, you will see the sun. This is a convention held in the United States for the Pope. And, and, and to honor the Pope and to honor the Catholic presence in America. But you will see that there is a sun in the middle representing Christianity. God's Son, the light of the world. The Savior is born. Here are pictures from uh, modern day uh, you know, magazines of Christians. The Savior is born. Is there a child? You see a child there? No, you see the Son. And so the Son is always golden. So the little the Son of God has the spokes of the, of the uh, ancient uh, cross behind his head. You will see is, is always pictured as a blonde or the sun baby. And here's the mother uh, holding her son. And here in the Vatican is a very interesting uh, a picture of, this is a sculptor in the Vatican. And it is showing Jesus' mother, the Virgin, which is Virgo, the Virgin of the Zodiac, holding her newborn son, S-U-N. And this is in the Vatican. Both baby Jesus and the grown-up Jesus are trying to show you what it's all symbolizing. It's symbolizing sun worship. Here you have the baby Jesus showing you the sun. Here are the sun worship in the Jerusalem temple, the uh, ancient Hebrews worshiping the sun. Today we have the Pope uh, you know, all over the world carrying the sun symbol for the sun. This is not a man on a cross. This is obviously sun worship. And you will see the sun everywhere here, the Pope. This is what is being promoted throughout the world as Christianity, but which is in fact sun worship. Now the ancient Egyptians pictured the, the sun had wings. And uh, we see it, 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 the sun is rolling across heaven. The sun in, in India, and the Hindu worship of the sun. Now here we have the Inca priest kneeling on an altar and, and offering up the wine in the altar to the sun god. The same you will see in Japan. You'll see in England, they're singing praises and a hymn to the rising sun. The wood carving uh, picture of the Jews and, and worshiping the sun. And here again is the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they are writing about their savior, the sun. Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is spring, summer, autumn, winter. The four seasons are symbolically represented by four gospels. This is a very important book showing that the sun in the church today Cathedrals are solar observatories. Now, of course, in, in India, the most important sun god in India was Krishna. 
Uh, we know that the Jesuits, when they went into India back in the 1500s, they learned very quickly the whole religion of God's son, the light of the world in India, who was Krishna. And they came back and infiltrated those teachings and concepts into what we call Christianity. This is the work of the church borrowing the stories from the ancient world of sun gods who died on the cross. Now here is an ancient Babylonian king, and his name was Shemesh, and he was a Babylonian sun king, and you'll see the altar in front of him has the sun. But this is very important, a Babylonian king being worshipped, and his name was Shemesh. It's because in the Hebrew language, or in the, the Jews, Shemesh is the sun in the Jewish language. Here we have 37 of what we call sons of God from the ancient world to the modern. And they all have the same identity and the same stories that go with their lives. They were born of a virgin. They, they died on a cross. They were dead for three days and then was resurrected and came back. Their, their father was a carpenter and they had 12, almost all of these had 12 followers or 12 apostles. They had the same story that we have in Christianity 37 times over. So it's a continuation of the same story coming out of the ancient world. And today we call it Catholicism or Christianity. So the reason why these themes keep repeating themselves is because it is what is called the greatest story ever told. I think it is the greatest story ever told that the sun is born each morning and ultimately dies at night and then uh, emerges the next morning and bring life back again, but then dies again. And so the whole story is on the subjects of the whole universe and how our skies work and how the planets work. I think that the idea that there are 37 major God sun gods and each have the same kind of a story, where they died the, the, you know, and were resurrected, and they had a virgin birth. It seems to imply that there was some sort of an ancient, really, truly ancient culture that developed this idea and this story for the world, and therefore it has become known as the greatest story ever told because it is, the is, in fact, the greatest story ever told, because so many ancient cultures have picked it up and applied to their own selves, their own gods, who had the same story of dying on a cross and being resurrected. There will not be any Messiah coming back for the Jews, for the Christians, or for any other religion on the earth. It's all based on ancient concepts of the prehistoric and ancient world of the sun representing life to the earth. So there won't be any Messiah coming back because there was none to start with. It's all based on the sun being the giver of life. So now that we have the, the technology today that we have, uh, where we can talk to the world uh, through the, 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 the system of technology, we can now begin to show the whole world where all of this has come from, all of these ideas and concepts and gods and sun gods have come from. We're now able to do that with the technology we have today. So, so many people today are now beginning to see that their ancient and highly venerated religions are merely part of a world continuation of a same story, the greatest story ever told. I'm Jordan Maxwell, and thanks for watching. We are as a people. Inherently and historically opposed to secret society, opposed to secret oaths, opposed to secret proceedings, secret for secret proceedings. No official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, 
could interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know.